Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with an Australian legend, Ron Moon. And Ron has an incredible history. Uh, Not only did did he have a full career in the Australian Army, but then he retired and he started writing guidebooks and he started working for the Australian four-wheel drive magazine industry. He's been an editor of um, several magazines in Australia. He's also produced countless books and guidebooks, had his own publishing company, works closely with HEMA Mac. Not only that, but his travel exploits are also very notable. So Ron and his wife, Viv, have traveled around the world. They've circumnavigated the planet. Uh, They've been to multiple continents in their vehicles. And we're going to talk about Ron's experience, his decades of traveling around the world, the things that he's learned. And Ron, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah, well, thanks. It's great to be here, mate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's such a pleasure. And and you've written for Overland Journal for well over a decade as well, on and off, which we're so grateful grateful for. So for those that are listening, you can find some of Ron's adventure stories in the magazine as well. But I'd love to start by asking you a few questions of kind of how the beginning of your life started. (laughs) Where did you grow up in Australia? What did you, what first inspired you about the outback? Okay. Well, I was born in the outback. I was born in Tenon Creek in the Northern Territory. Okay. And uh, we moved down to Quorn in the Flinders Ranges fairly early on. And that's where I grew up as a young kid, you know, going out rabbit trapping and then with a single shot 22 and all that sort of stuff with my brothers. And then, um, yeah, you know, that's where the love of that desert country comes mm. in. And I think that still puts my soul, yeah. You know. I would say that, uh, the because okay, I've not been to the Kimberley yet, but the Flinders is one of my most favorite parts of Australia. There's just something about that range where it's not been weathered quite as much as the rest of the continent, where it's endured, you know, the, the hardness of those rocks and yeah. just some of those canyons are absolutely stunning. Yeah. So that, what a neat place to grow up. Yeah, it was. And, uh, yeah, you, know, you won't get any argument with me about those comments and uh, you, you probably won't get an unbiased point of view from me either <laughs> about the Flinders Ranges. But uh, oh, it's amazing how those places can just kind of stick with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. And, you know, and in a couple of weeks' time, I'll be back in Oz. First place we'll be camping is in the Flinders Ranges uh, as we head to do a trip through the desert country. And as I remember, there is an outpost there. Called, is that the Parinchilla Hotel? Is that the oh, right Parachilla one? Parinchilla Hotel. Feral food. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I went through there with my dad years ago and yeah we st- and I had been there before and I remembered that you could get you know crocodile and yep. and eat a, eat an emu and everything yep. so it was just yeah, I remember taking my dad out to dinner there and the plate comes out and it's, it's got a bunch of little flags stuck in the meat you know <laughs> this is crocodile and this is camel and and this is emu and this yep. is you know, yeah. you know kangaroo and everything yeah. so yeah well, the people who own that property uh, own one of the, a number of the sheep stations around the place okay. or ranches as you sure call sure it. they've made a real success out of that uh, Barrel Children Hotel. They have, and it's a great little oh, spot yeah. to stay. And yeah. and you know, you've been on the dusty track for days or weeks, sometimes at yeah. a time. It's a neat, neat spot to stay. But I can see why you uh, enjoyed the Flinders so much because it really is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and then, what what did you? What would you say were some of the things as a as a kid that really inspired you to not only want to travel by vehicle but to travel at all? Yeah, well, I think my dad was a bit of a traveler. Uh, he's a bit of a dark side, which we only found out a few years ago. In fact, in two. 2000, 2001, and um, found we had two brothers in America. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, a lot of the truth came out then. My dad died many years ago, but he was a traveler. Sure. And uh, just wanted, he'd settle down for a couple of years, and then he'd pick mum up and off we'd go you know, sure. somewhere else. And uh, so I got I got that love of traveling, and I can always remember going out with him on the Wallachra Plains more than anything, just on the east side of the Flinders Ranges and traveling with him through there and shooting bunny rabbits and Amazing. stuff like that. And they were the things that stuck with me, yeah. I joined the army when I was fifteen or nearly sixteen. Army. That's very that's very young. Is that yeah. is that something that they allow? Is it like a part of your yeah, education was, at that point or how does that work? Yeah, it was it was in those days as a uh, army apprentice and okay. Yeah, when he's an army apprentice and became an electrician working on gun control systems and stuff like that later on in my army career. But um so yeah, so you know I started driving Land Rovers in about sixty seven mm-hmm. and um, got posted to Woomera, the guided weapons uh, area and there's a lot of 
Americans up there at the time, just finishing off launching uh, some of their missile systems. And um, of course, we ran around in Land Rovers all the time and sure. took every opportunity to go out and <laughs> find some crashed aircraft or whatever it was. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, and you end up doing cross country, and, and that's where you know, I really fell in love with four wheel driving and doing cross country on a compass bearing and all that sort of stuff. No tracks. And, and Australia is just prime for that. It's so incredible. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to get too far from that last comment that you made about having two brothers in America because it's <laughs> fascinated. Have you met them? Have you have you spent time with them? Yeah, well, in fact, um, both of them were fairly high profile people and uh, one was uh, in charge of the American Literary Board for uh, schools in America for a long time. Okay. And the other became uh, vice president of Northwest American Airlines and then quit very early, followed his real love of, of looking for American MIAs, World War II MIAs around wow. the world. Wow. And he was, he, uh, he was, his group was called MIA Hunters and it was um, declared by the American government as the most successful MIA group. Wow. Uh, I joined him on a couple of expeditions. I had a really big one in New Guinea or he had a number in New Guinea, but uh, I joined him for the last one as it turned out. And that was a month long expedition for aircraft MIA. Were, were you, were you able to find any of the aircraft? Well, we've, he had a number of scouts working for him, uh, sure. uh, local, local scouts, and um, they would um, get the rough idea of where the aircraft was. We would go in, take photographs and GPS it and all that sort of stuff, and we would find a serial number on that aircraft, whether oh, it was sure. a machine gun or an yeah, engine. Anything that helps tie it back. And then uh, my brother had the contacts uh, in the MIA unit in Hawaii, Wow! and he would ring them up and go, well, this, we've got this aircraft. We've, this is a serial number of a machine gun. What is it? And they would come back within 24 hours and say, yes, we know about that aircraft. They were all rescued or whatever. Sure. And then the ones they didn't know about, we would do a little bit more of a search, see if we could get dog tags or like that, and we would uh, record the site fairly uh, you know, thoroughly mm. and um, and then hand that all that information over to MIA unit in Hawaii. Wow. By that stage, they would have names and sure. if seven people were missing or – There were some incredible stories that came out of it. And because of my background, um, and my brother hired – we hired a couple of land cruisers up there. And sure. I was, I was designated the official driver, so <laughs> – <laughs> I got away with the easy thing. But the, the funny thing about that was the recovery gear. There's no recovery gear in any of these vehicles. No. But everywhere you went, they'd come across a whole pile of locals. In fact, we were giving them lifts all the time, you know. Sure. We'd have 20 people on board the back of the ute, you know. We'd take them out sure. to the main road or whatever. If we got bogged, they'd just get out and all lift it up and <laughs> push or whatever. Perfect. You know? It was a fabulous experience. What was the what was the most meaningful outcome from that experience with your brother? We went into one village and the guides who'd been working for them for two years said, oh, the chief will not let anybody into this site. So uh, he said he, he wants to see the boss man, brother, Brian. So Brian went in to see him and, of course, a couple of us tagged along with him, the old chief. He said, when I was a boy at seven, um, there was a dog fight going on above our village and uh, American aircraft got shot down. And he said, when I was 16, I wrote a letter to people who who concerned about, you've lost your son, da, da, da. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm after him. Mm. But he said, I didn't know who to send it to. Yeah. Pulled it out and said, give it to you. Oh, wow. You'd kept it that whole time. Yeah, kept incredible. all that time. That's incredible. Incredible. And um, so then he got his grandson to lead us in into that wrecked aircraft. Wow. And, um, still had the American signature on the plane and all stuff. So yeah, so that was that was one of of a number of uh, exploits and uh, finds that we found. It's just fabulous. And what an incredible thing to do with your brother. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. mean that you didn't even know you had. <laughs> I mean what a, that's a that's a fascinating story. That yeah. is just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, is. Neat. it was just unbelievable, and, and it was so good that it worked out so well. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, geez, that's incredible. Yeah. And then, so you were at 15, you joined the army. Yeah. And did they ship you off? I mean, were you gone? Well, you know, I joined the army and became an electronics technician. And then I became, uh, I got seconded to the British army. Mm. This was during the height of the Vietnam War. Yeah. And nearly every one of my classmates went to Vietnam. I was one of 140 that did. Sure. Uh, because I was seconded to this secret British unit uh, doing weapons testing up in Woomera. Right. And uh, like I said, that was when the uh, yeah. British Army had this thing called adventure training. Mm. She didn't have to carry a gun or a backpack with you, but you just borrow a vehicle and go out camping, things like this. They just sure. wanted you to be in the bush right. and learning. Gain skills. Learning those bush skills. And um, I thought, fantastic <laughs> idea. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I became a bit of an expert in that over the yeah. next, all the rest of my career. Really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was really done a lot of that sort of stuff. And one of the one of the best things was in 19, about 1976, um, we led an expedition out into a remote country in South Australia with a group of paleontologists and biologists from the Australian National Museum. And uh, during that trip, 
doing cross country mm. to the remote salt lakes, looking for dinosaur bones and all this mm. sort of stuff. I just loved it. No question. Yeah, that was that was life. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting the times that I've been to Australia as a veteran myself, um, interacting with the Australian vets. I was in Melbourne uh, for Anzac Day, and I yeah. and I walked down the street from the hotel to a, a small memorial, uh, and that happened to be a World War II memorial. But uh, the number of veterans that were there, and yeah. they approached me and they asked if I was a veteran. And I said, oh, I am. I said, but I'm from America. And yeah. it really touched them that, yeah, yeah. that I was there. And then to go to the memorial in Melbourne, yeah. the big one, yep. and to see, I was walking because it's, it's very, uh, there's not a lot to it. The walls are filled with names on the yeah. inside and you're walking around and you know, you get to the bees yeah. and then you start to go down the list and you see all the Brady's. Yeah. There was a lot of them. Yeah. And there was a lot of your young men that, oh, yeah. that died in those conflicts. Yeah, sure. you know, the Commonwealth nations really did take quite yeah. the impact at that time. So yeah. interesting you brought that up because uh, I was over here for your uh, big day of uh, Memorial Day sure. with my brother and my brother was doing some talks and lectures on on what he does. And uh, and he said, oh, I've got my, I've got my brother up audience. Him and his two brothers in Australia had 67 years of service between them. We got a standing ovation. I bet. It was incredible. Yeah. People were coming up and congratulating yeah. us and all Amazing. that. Well, we appreciate your many years of service. And it sounds like in some of the same ways that the military inspired me, the yeah. vehicle-based travel, it did the same thing for you. Yeah, it did. So you did a you did a twenty year career in the yep. army. Were you ever sent overseas or? No, I, I was I was sent to Singapore with uh, the British um, oh, with sure. this British unit. Okay, doing um, testing over there and all wow. that sort of stuff. But when I came back from that unit, uh, I was I was seen as a, a mil- um, guided weapons expert. They sure. weren't required. They weren't required in Vietnam. <laughs> gotcha. So I yeah. never got to Vietnam. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it was meant to be. Uh, yeah. It wasn't meant to be. Yeah, yeah. go where the army sends you. Not, That's right. You know. But yeah, I mean, we got out of the army after. 20 years and I said I don't want to do electronics anymore. Sure. Okay well what are we going to do? By that stage we founded a magazine called Action Outdoor Australia which was into the backpacking sports, canoeing. Wilderness stuff is what I love you know, wilderness canoeing, rafting and I was never a good rock climber <laughs> um, and, um, and neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, and then we'd gone to Cape York in uh, in the early 80s and, uh, and in 84 we thought because you know, we got up there and I like motivating people to go and see the country and this sort of thing. We got up to Cape York and we'd been up there for three or four weeks and people had gone across the Jardine back in those days the ferry had drive across this very impressive river and uh, and they come back and go oh there's nothing to see and I'm going hold oh, on I spent three or four weeks up there <laughs> never got bored or anything so that was the motivation to write our first guidebook sure that was in 1984 and doesn't doesn't that river still have crocs in it oh yeah yeah I mean it, you hear every once in a while of like a German tourist that goes missing <laughs> <laughs> it's always why is it always the Germans I think maybe yeah, they, yeah, maybe they well, taste a little better yeah, to the crocs I don't know and, and also the locals because you know, familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> yeah, and, for uh, sure. Yeah, they swim across the river to get to the ferry or something like that. Oh man, crocodile. I remember when we'd done one trip, the, uh, a group of friends who were right into wilderness canoeing and we'd backpack in with inflatable canoes in our backpack and then walk down the river until we could start paddling. Sure. And this is what we'd done on the Jardin. First thing, first descents of any route from the source to the sea and um, and we took five days and my brother so um, doing vehicle back up for me and he's talking to the uh, the Aboriginal uh, ferryman. The ferryman goes, has your brother got a gun? And uh, Dave says, oh, it's a national park. You know, you're not allowed to carry a gun. And I goes, oh, old man, crocodile, he don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> the crocs like, I like this place. They don't have guns. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Uh, so they were great trips, you know, first ascents of rivers and things like that. So they were back in the 90s. And there, and there were big, we had run-ins with big crocs every trip. And most people never came back. You know, we'd go with six or four or five other people. Folks. And only me and my mate ever went back at once, yeah. <laughs> Everybody else read it. Those crocs are too big. And now, you know, 20, 30 years further on, crocs have got bigger. Yeah, sure. And uh, even less afraid of humans. So For sure. Just, They've I, had more I meals. Wouldn't be, <laughs> I wouldn't be paddling those rivers, especially in an inflatable. Oh, that's so true. So, I mean, Cape York is a spot that fascinates a lot of people to yeah. travel. Uh, yeah. You know, things like the canning stock. I mean, these are all uh, fantastic routes that are kind of spoken of in hushed tones because yeah. they're so they're so meaningful to the overlander. And, and I haven't made it all the way to the end of Cape York, Matt, yeah. Matt Scott, our, my co-host, has several times. But how have you seen that change? from the 80s when you first did the trip to now, what are you seeing that's different? The big, the big thing is back when we first went up there, and I certainly wasn't the first four-wheel driver to go up there. There was quite a few still going for me, but there's a hell of a lot more people. The big thing was that in those days, the big thing was to get to the top and that whole expedition, you know, sure. to get to the top. And that took you a couple of weeks from out of Cairns, a lot of hard work and sure. river crossings and things like that. And of course, the Jardine, you know, it's a fairly fast-flowing river. It's 
145 metres, about 170 yards from bank to bank, sand and crocs. Back in those days, if a croc showed up, he wasn't there for very long. Somebody would get rid of him. But um, nowadays, you know, Cape has opened up. Aboriginal communities have opened up their lands in a lot of places. So you can go out to other places. So the object isn't really to get top. It's what everybody goes to. Sure. Or the most tip. But um, so many other things you can do. Right. So that's what people do. Yeah, you know, they go up there and go off off that major route to the top and, uh, and go fishing at Weeper or Portland Roads or whatever it may be. It was such a beautiful area. I made it um, maybe three or four hours north of Cairns, yeah. so along the coast. Yeah. And Cake it was just, or something like that's that. That's what it was. Yeah. And it was gorgeous. Yeah. Beautiful. It, yeah. I mean, the, the I was so impressed by the tropical birds. The flora had changed yeah. so much yeah. from from what you experienced, even in Brisbane. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a it's a fascinating area, and you know, even after all this time, it's probably the most popular four wheel drive destination in Australia. You know, thousands get up. Yeah. You, know, you don't really want to be there in the school holidays in August, September. Sure. But um, you know, I was up there last year with my son. He was running a tour up there, and uh, he'll be up there again in another few weeks. I don't think I'll be able to make it though, uh, this year, but um, it is still a fantastic trip. How many trips have me and Viv done there? Uh, somewhere in excess of 40. Oh, geez, that's um, unbelievable. We haven't got to the top every time. Sure. Probably 15 trips, something yeah. like that at the top. Sure. But you get up there and you get lost in some area, Cape Trib or over on the western side around the Gulf Country or, yeah. or whatever, whatever tickles your fancy. You go looking for old gold mines or crashed aircraft or sure. whatever. And you've traveled across Australia many times. What What is your favorite place in Australia, if you were to have to pick? Well, I guess I guess if you look at the number of times I've been there, it's probably Cape Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think I you know, started traveling across the bite, as in not the Nullarbor Lane, the highway, but the bite around the coastline. Uh, we started traveling that in about 2008, done little bits of it back in my early days when we were spearfishing and things like that. Mm. Never set out to drive around the coast. I've got to say that's probably the best coastal expedition drive for drive trip you do in Australia. You go from Sejuna, South Australia, to Esperance in Western Australia. Right. It's about uh, 1,450, well, it's nearly 1,000 miles. It's only one fuel place you can really get and that's right on the border at Euclid. And um, and I can we can do that now with only about 30 mile of bitchy black top. Sure. All the rest is on either on the cliff tops, beaches, in amongst the sand dunes. Well and I have you to thank for the trip that I did across there because you had done that yep. trip um, with Brad McCarthy I think yep. and so he knew the way so when I in, in 2018 when I drove yep. the bike it was along the track that you guys had kind of pioneered yeah. and it was incredible how remote that was. I mean that one there's one remote kind of on a station where they do a lot of like bird studies and yeah, things yeah, like that. That right. was, yeah. that was yeah, bird observatory. It was fascinating. And then there, we also took the little detour north. Um, so north of the highway, there was this abandoned gas station and, <laughs> and, and town. Those, those old cars and stuff. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yep. I know exactly where you are. And, uh, that was fascinating. Hundreds of cars that yeah. broke down when the old Nullarbor was just a track. Sure. And uh, they left there. It was incredible. And the old, and the old station and the old homes and yeah. stuff like that. It was, it was just, that whole area felt very remote. Yeah. I mean, the canning stock, no question, feels extremely remote because oh, yeah. uh, we didn't encounter another vehicle the whole time. Yeah. Uh, when we got close to the top, we were some of the first cars through that particular year, but when we got close to the top, we did start to see some vehicles, but yeah. the rest of it, there was just nobody there. No yeah. one. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous trip. Uh, Bib's done it even more than me. Um, <laughs> that's funny stories. Isn't it? But uh, uh, well, we, we pick, one of your, the... pick one of your favorite funny stories. <laughs> Let's hear that. As editor of the magazine, I used to run trips for readers and I'd organize nice this trip up the canning stock route where we do some cleanups and all this sort of sure. stuff. And then um, Land Rover came along and said, well, we want you to go to, I can't remember now where it was or something. And um, I said to Viv, oh, I've got this trip, <laughs> <laughs> this freebie trip to England and then rah, rah, rah to drive the new Range Rover or whatever it was. So how about you You taking this trip? So she got the job of uh, leading this trip <laughs> up the canning stock route in a, in a Chevy Suburban, would oh, you believe? Wow. Wow. You oh. spent it with her dad, which was really great. Oh, and, that's uh, wonderful. But that old Chevy Suburban urban graded the track all the way. She I can was, imagine dragging the belly the whole way. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and a lot of vehicles have been nearly written off along that track. Remember when uh, Mercedes tried to do like a, a demonstration <laughs> of, of durability with the G class and yep. you have to respect that track and people, they get in a hurry. It's very long. It's not that technical, uh, but it's abusive. Yep. If you, if you don't let those shocks cool down and you don't check the bolts every day, you're going to have stuff go wrong and, and they, or overload the vehicle, for example. Yeah, so it's not the G wagons were necessarily um, the problem. It was that the people that were responsible for caring for them weren't yeah. doing their job. And you know what journeys are like, you know, yeah, yeah, they'll sure. go a bit quicker than the, the normal journey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's 
thousand kilometers. Yeah, it's a yeah. long way. Yeah, I've seen a lot of vehicles. Shocks are the big. Yeah, they just smoke them. Yeah, yeah. shocks are the big thing. And then, and obviously, any uh, any of those tracks out there, you know, just pounding the chassis takes and For sure. break and tow bars break and all that sort of stuff. It certainly does. As a magazine editor, and with all this time that you've traveled in Australia, you've used about every single vehicle yeah. that was available in your market. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite? What was or what was your top two or three? Well, you know, Land Cruiser's got to be in, in amongst there somewhere. And we've had a number of Land Cruisers over the years. Just ordered a new one. Hopefully it'll be here by Christmas. What did you order? What model did you order? Oh, uh, Truby. Okay. Series Troop Carry. Nice. So I've got a 79 at home, which is out with sun in the desert at the moment. Sure. But uh, the vehicle that's done the most with us is a Nissan Patrol, GU Patrol. Yeah. And um, those are famous. For 20 the odd years old now and uh, been around the world. Done four or five trips up the Canning. I don't know how many crossings of the Simpson Desert. I don't know how many on Cape Hill. Uh, it's got a lot of miles up on it. Does that have the 4.2 liter yeah, diesel? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. That's a famous motor. Yeah. And the, and the differentials on that were so strong. I mean, they were stronger than the Land Cruiser. Oh yeah. 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 The drive, I mean, the patrol was never as good in NVH as the yeah. cruiser and the engines were always a little bit lacking compared to a cruiser engine, but uh, the drivetrain was bought. Yeah. Down. Literally. Yeah. You guys have done all, you did all these trips to Australia. Had you literally just done it all and then you wanted to go see the world, but what, what's inspired that transition okay. from I'm traveling around Australia to now I want to go see the rest of the world. Well, went to Africa. Okay. Just after I got out. Well, when I got out of the army, we thought, okay, we've got to make a name for ourselves. Sure. And at that stage, Qantas was just starting to fly into Africa, into Zimbabwe. They weren't flying into South Africa. Okay. Of apartheid. Sure. So we went to them and said, this is what we do. We got a, con- we got a contract. Away we went. And then that sort of started this love affair with Africa. Was, yeah, I can see you that. Ne- you never go to Africa once. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, it is. So we started going to Africa and then I'm thinking, go over <laughs> I'd love to go. Over. Yeah, it just swirled from there. And then, of course, we got to England in uh, 2007, whatever it was, when we got to England uh, after driving up through Africa. And uh, I said to Viv, oh, yeah, well, we've got to ship the vehicle home. <laughs> Let's drive across Russia, as yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah. And what was your what was your route uh, to make it to Vladivostok? We went up to, uh, shipped across or caught the ferry across to Norway, mm-hmm. up the coast of Norway to North Cape. Beautiful, beautiful country. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, it's expensive. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Fuel, food, beer, all the important ingredients yeah. of life and um, <laughs> and then drop down uh, to St. Petersburg beautiful city so you went you went through Sweden and yeah. Finland and then yeah. yeah oh yeah we just missed we just skirted along right and then uh, St. Petersburg beautiful city it is beautiful yeah and I say to people if you're going to go to Russia and go <laughs> if you want to go there now uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg go to Moscow first and then St. Petersburg sure because you do it the other way around you'll be really disappointed Moscow. well because uh, as I recall the czars they they hired all these Italian architects to help them build St. Petersburg. And it is really a stunning city. It's it's beautiful. And there's a lot of art there. Um, Whereas Moscow was, you know, just open land that they they developed a massive city of concrete on top of. And it's not to say that there aren't really charming pieces of Moscow because there are, uh, but it is so different. St. St. Petersburg feels substantial old uh, history and and you can tell the difference. And like you said, the art there. Yeah, it's really good. It is. So much of it. Yes. In in the hermitage. Yeah. It is and I guess if you look at World War Two and the Germans sacked Europe and got all the treasure and the Russians beat the Germans and took all the treasure. <laughs> That's what all, happens. Ended up History the repeats Germans. itself. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> From there, we dropped down through Russia, um, Kazakhstan. Yeah. Had to go back into Russia because China wouldn't let us cut across. Yeah. And then into Mongolia. And what route did you take across Mongolia? Well, we started off in the northwest corner. Sure. Yeah, I'm familiar with that border. That is, I think it's one of the longest, at the time, it was one of the longest no man's lands on the planet. It. That's right. I think it's over 20 miles you have to drive between border posts, maybe yep. even a little further than that. Yep. And so you're just, you're the so whole you're, time you're thinking, what happens if I break down? <laughs> like, exactly. fortunately, it was mostly downhill, I think. And I was in yeah. a little chimney, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, I got to make it to the border. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, you reminded me of that. I've forgotten about that, how wide it was, the no man's land. And of course, that uh, Mongolian box rally yeah. was on at the same time. What was it? <laughs> yeah, we were helping all these people out because, you know, they're, they're so and, fun. Yeah. It all these clapped out little cars and tires are popping and all this sort of thing. And we're repairing tires for them and getting them on the road again. And then down in Ulaanbaatar and then down to the Gobi and then a big circuit around the Gobi. Of course, it rained down in the Gobi. Oh, we, wow. We ended up uh, helping some of the tour operators out of there, getting out of the bogs and then back to Ulaanbaatar and then up, up around the Chinese border up to right. uh, Lake Bacal. And that's incredible too. Yeah. yeah. Just the size of that lake. I think it has nearly the same amount of fresh water as the Great Lakes in North America. I find it's just, that, it's so I find deep. That 
hard to believe. Because it's so deep. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it wasn't until, I mean, sometime in the last century is when they finally found the depth of it, but it was, it was like maybe in the sixties. I mean, it took them a while to find yeah. the bottom of this lake. Yeah. It's, it is unbelievable. We camped beside it for a couple of nights. So weather, it's a, it's a weather factory of Siberia, basically. Interesting. And, uh, and then of course we just, we basically follow the Chinese Russian book. An unbelievable trip, but boy, you know, the people couldn't relate outside of uh, Vladivostok and St. Petersburg and Moscow. They couldn't relate to travelers, really. Mm. Like, why are you here? Why are, what are you doing? Are you why are you doing, doing this? You, yeah. you must be a Western spy. <laughs> of course, you meet some nice people. No question. You know. What I found was most challenging is the language barrier. The, yeah. In most of Siberia, the small villages, you, it's very difficult to find an English speaking oh, yeah. person. And, and the language is so different. Yep. You know, it's not a Latin derived language. So, you know, like yeah. if you're in Italy, you can kind of make it work or whatever. But in, yeah. in Russia, it's so different. Uh, the side, the side posts and all. <laughs> yeah. You kind of, you kind of hope you're going the right way. Um, what did you think of Vladivostok? Well, we spent a week there as you normally do when you're trying to organize trying to shipping and out, all yeah. that sort of stuff. We stayed in some fancy hotel overlooking the harbor. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, look, we, we, you've run into customs, run into uh, sure. shipping agents and things like that. So you get a, uh, a different point of view about a city, I guess. We certainly weren't there sightseeing and things right. like that. But um, I mean, it's a magnificent harbor. And it all is that. very pretty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 surprised me because yeah. we we drove into Magadan and we shipped by container to Vladivostok. So to see the difference between Magadan and Vladivostok is obviously yeah. very stark, but I was so impressed with how beautiful Vladivostok yeah. was. It was a magnificent harbor yeah. and, stuff. and they were doing some um, uh, drills uh, and the airplanes were coming in, just skimming the surface of the of the wow. harbor, dropping a uh, fire retardant and stuff sure. like that on smoking barges. And it was very impressive, in fact, the flying wow. these guys, wow. picking up water and then dropping it on these smoking barges. And, Amazing. Yeah, so we were watching that from the hotel room. But, uh, oh, cool. Yeah, look, yeah, back everything changed with uh, you know, when the Twin Towers came down and right. once upon a time you could go into the harbours and you know, check your vehicle onto the onto the ship damn near. Now you get locked at the gate, somebody takes your vehicle and you go, oh, I hope I see that in Australia again. Yeah, and then where did you ship from Vladivostok to? To Australia. Oh, yeah. so you yeah. ship back. That's a challenge too, shipping anything back into Australia. Cleanliness requirements are very strict. Man, oh man, a lot of people come undone doing that. Yeah. And we've helped a couple of people out. And every time we've gone into Australia with our vehicle, it's taken two to three weeks to get it out of customs and quarantine. That's right. And I know and I know people who've been in uh, ship vehicles into Australia and four weeks later, they're still waiting for the yep. vehicle. And of course, that's not the real problem. The real problem is your visa's ticking away. Yep. You haven't got accommodation. You say right. you're staying in a hotel or ooh, and it adds up. And the people are in despair by the time, you know, three or four weeks have gone by. It's true. And I, I think it's the, it's the one place in the world that I think having a shipping agent um, is is almost a requirement because some of the shipping agents they they have agreements with the Australian government yeah. to be able to certify the vehicle as yep. being as meeting the requirements for cleanliness. Yep. So person that you're hiring is now held responsible for the yeah. outcome, and it allows them because as an individual you go and you say, all right, I'm going to have this custom this um, you know ag inspection of the vehicle. It fails. Now yep. it's got to be quarantined for another however many days, seven yep. days, I think at least. Um, whereas this other company. Can just they can just keep cleaning it until it passes, yeah. and then and, and then the, you're off to yeah, the races. The cleaning, the cleaning bills, you know, seven hundred to a thousand dollars every time. Yep. It's very expensive. Yep. Yeah, but it, it works. I mean, and of course, our vehicles were filthy from having done the road of bones and everything like that. They were absolutely filthy. Yeah. We had them cleaned three times in in uh, Russia, and they actually did a pretty good job. It's because I had some local folks that I knew well, so they like I had a relationship with them, and yeah. they took the time to do it right. But then it still had to be cleaned in Australia <laughs> again. Amazing. It is. It's real uh, real trap for young players going into there. But I can't blame Australia for it though. You guys are an island yeah. and you have these very sensitive ecosystems. If somebody was to bring in some noxious weed or whatever, it could yeah. it could really damage yep. your beautiful yep. country. Yeah, so. we've got fire ants in Brisbane now and they're really trying to spend an awful lot of money trying to get them under trial. Yeah. I met a, uh, I met uh, some quarantine people up in uh, Cape York and uh, we were in a national park and three, uh, four wheelers go by, like sitting the guns on the back. Wow, <laughs> What's, what are they doing? They're not just normal people. Yeah, there's got to be something going and uh, they were quarantined and they were up there shooting pigs and wild horses and doing blood tests and see and things like that. Because oh, sure. they, they, te- they told me then, he said, the place is more quarantined people, Cape York, than the rest of any other port in Australia apart from Sydney. Oh, wow. More quarantined. Because we're only 100 kilometres from New Guinea. True. And he said, if, if hoof and mouth or anything like that comes into Australia, it's going to come through Cape York. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's going to cost billions exports. And- oh, yeah. And you're, I mean, the cattle industry is really yeah. important in yeah. Australia. All right.
right. So you shipped back into Australia. Now, as I recall, you guys had quite the experience crossing Russia. Yeah. And you're starting to figure out what are we going to do next? You've been traveling in a patrol (laughs) with a roof tent. Um, What were some things that you learned from that first trip? What were the things that you took away that, hey, this worked great. And then these are some things that I'd like to change. Yeah, look, rooftop tents are more and more popular every year in America as they are in Australia. Yeah. And I think they came out of Africa more than anywhere else. For sure. And uh, people don't like sleeping on the ground in Africa. Understandably. Yeah. <laughs> we had a rooftop tent, fairly Australian made one, and uh, it was really good. And it was great for Africa. But you know, you start to find the limitations of that when you're in Siberia. When we got to ship back to Australia and we thought, well, we'll convince Viv to uh, continue our journeys around the world, I um, decided we'd take a, a small camper trailer. And I think I think one of the other things that is happening, especially in Australia, I don't know whether it's happening in America so much, but certainly in Australia, there's, there's a real thing about GVM mm-hmm. and how much weight you're allowed to carry and insurance problems, you know, you have an accident and all that stuff. So there's this move across to trailers, camper vans. Yeah, because then you have the, the gross combined vehicle weight yeah. rating between the truck and the trailer. So there's that move. And, and that's one of the big things. We were talking about Cape York and one of the big changes a lot of time. You know, when we went to Cape York in the 80s, I had an old trailer that I built myself, you know, got it from, started off as a military trailer and I fired it. Sure. Land cruiser wheels and springs <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I was about one of the very few people towing a trailer. Now, very you know, 95% of the vehicles towing trailers. Up Interesting. Um, and it's all because of this thing about weight and all that sort of gear. And also people you know, want a hot water system. Yeah. Shower. Yeah. Imagine just going into the bush with just a backpack. I mean, it's like, you yeah. know, it, it works fine too. Yeah. You know, you can actually travel very light, yeah. uh, but it, it has definitely been a trend that we have seen as well. So the trucks are getting bigger. Uh, full-size vehicles are now much yep. more common than they ever have been. Yep. Um, and trailers are more common than they yeah. ever have been. Big trailers even. Yeah. Um, and so you do, you do gain a whole bunch of comfort, but there are, it's important for people to know, like those that are listening, that there's a, there's a huge compromise on the other side. Yes, there is. You have a lot more expense. Yep. You're restricted on where you can go. Um, the vehicle gets very, very heavy. Yep. Uh, your fuel costs go up. Yep. So. And the other thing, uh, we had a, my son specializes in taking groups with trailers and there's been this since COVID, especially a lot of people coming into the market who've never gone four wheel driving, never gone camping. Mm. And uh, we've done a trip last year across the desert, fairly remote country, Gary Highway, uh, Gun Barrel, uh, Connie Sue, and Bedell, and um, roads that are iconic in Australia, roads, tracks. Sure. And um, get these people there. And brand new rigs, brand new cruiser, 200 series cruiser, brand new camper trailer, you know, probably $300,000 combined sure. expense. And um, talking to them, and um, how much water are you carry? Oh, oh, 450 litres, 200 gallons. <laughs> what? Yeah. That's almost half a tonne. That's right. Yeah, at 8.33 8. pounds per gallon. So, that's heavy. So vehicles, and yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's got a 1,600 kilo axle on it. You hit a bump, 400 kilos of water on board. Sure. And things bend. We ended up, there was three vehicles ended up with trailers with bent stub axles and purely because they were carrying too much water. That's right. Too much weight. Yeah, yeah. Got to get that down. You really do. And and I think that the trip actually improves. Oh, more, yeah. The more simple that we keep things, the yeah. more the trip improves. Yeah. Uh, because then you're not, you're not spending so much energy on all the stuff you brought along. Yeah. And, and especially with electronics and so man, true. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Your cars don't have enough USB ports. I know. I know. It's so true. Yeah, it's so true. So you guys decide that you're going to try a different tack. South America is next. So what did you guys decide to use in South America? What well, was took, your setup? Yeah, well, well, we took our GU patrol and uh, we towed a uh, small camper trailer and that allowed us to, to get friends come in. Sure. And they were relegated to the rooftop tent Sure, and um, we stayed in the camper trailer, but it allowed us that. And so it sort of made the trip a lot more enjoyable because mm. I, I really enjoy being out there with friends and sharing the experience and sure. that's especially when I'm in Australia where I know the country so well and all from the history. Yeah, South Africa was just fabulous and the people were fantastic. In fact, it's stopping in one little national park in Argentina and we hid from people because they were bringing <laughs> gifts to us and wanted they're, to talk to they're us. They're very friendly. Oh, yeah. Was, and and have you found, I mean, and this is just kind of a fun question to ask, but it seems that Australians are kind of universally loved around the world. There's just something so yeah. dang charming about yeah, you well, guys. Have you found that to be true? Well, I, yeah, look, we haven't had any any huge problems at all. Yeah. Let's get accepted everywhere. And I think here in America, we really get accepted once they know you're an Australian. You know, I've had people come up to me and just say, thanks. Thanks for your support. Yeah. And, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's been really, really, yeah. we just love being in, you know, done, spent nine months traveling through South America, uh, ended up in North America, came into Mexico and then uh, into uh, San Diego and LA. Uh, at the end of 2011, I left our vehicle here, went home for a few months, came back and drove up to Alaska in 2012. We've been coming back ever since. 
means, you know, we couldn't leave our vehicle here. You're not allowed to do that. So after 12 months, we shipped our vehicle back home and we bought a, a Ram 2500, put a four-wheel camper on it, come back for three months every year. So Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's just fabulous. What, what do you think of the the Ram and the four-wheel camper? Look, I, I'm really impressed. I think they're underestimated here yeah. in, as an overland vehicle in Australia. Whether it's a, my mate who, who we travelled around the world with, he's got a Ford uh, 250 yeah. camper on the back. And, um, you know, he's done everything across the Sahara, you know, yeah. done an awful lot in Australia. He's done more in Australia than I have. Uh, desert trips and things like that. So I, I reckon they've been underestimated. And I um, think we've, uh, Graham Bell, I've yeah, uh, sure. added a, a little bit to his article on big rigs. That's right. And uh, my thoughts on that. Yeah, I, you know, they can carry the weight easily. And, mm. and the good thing about having a vehicle like that in the Americas is you know, spare parts and knowledge on how to fix them and like that. Absolutely. And then you you do get to add a little bit more of that comfort. You get that yeah. kind of quiet place to sleep at the end of the night. Yeah. You know, you don't have dust in your bed and yeah. Yeah, it does make a big difference. Yeah. So after having traveled around the world and I mean, decades now of experience for Viv and you, what, what do you think are the things that you've learned most? Maybe about yourself um, first, what, what do you, what have you kind of things have changed about you after having spent so many years seeing the well, world? Well, I've spent most of it with Viv. So uh, I've, I've become to depend on her in lots of ways. Uh-huh. And, uh, and um, you know, it's all a compromise it is. in equipment and how you relate to other people and stuff like that. And uh, people are always surprised that uh, you live in that for three months at a time sort of thing. And we've had people go, oh, God, I'd be divorced if I tried to live with my wife in that for three months and things like that. <laughs> How have you guys made that work then? What, what have what have you guys learned together? Because you've seen the world together. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what have you learned? Well, I've mellowed, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> my wife is killing herself uh, laughing there. But um, yeah, you know, I, I guess being ex-military, you sort of grow up, especially when you join the army at 15, 16. Sure. You, you get older in the military way. That's right. And um, I had to break that a bit, I guess. I ended up a warrant officer class one entry, so sure. um, telling people what to do. Yeah. Doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you start telling your family what to do, yeah, it no, doesn't work. Uh, yeah. uh, so I think the other thing with, uh, with vehicles, vehicles will become more reliable. But the problem is when they do break down, yeah, it's so complicated. And um, I remember I, we broke down the old Nissan Patrol. I'd only had one electronic box in it, and that was a security box to key a key start. And I was really remote country, northwest of Alice Springs uh, in some Aboriginal land. And, and uh, drove into photograph this water hole, jumped out, took photographs, jumped back in the car, hit the starter, nothing. The starter motor turned over, it sounds like fuel. You go looking, ended up on the sat phone to my mate at a server saying, Well, what, what's the go? He said, Oh, there's an electronic box in there that sends some codes to the sure. fuel pump. So then I rang Viv and said, Okay, this is where we are. And that's the first time in 40 odd years that I've ever been recovered by somebody. Ah, uh-huh, that's amazing. So that electronic box, when I got back to, back to civilization, ripped, Gone. That, <laughs> ripped that box out and just put 12 volts, 12 volts into that into that field. There you pump. go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You want to turn the key and hear things happen. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. You know, one of the things that we always like to ask and you've written many books yourself. Yeah. But one of the questions that we always like to ask are what are the books that you've read in your life that you think have been the most impactful for you as a person and for you as a traveler? Well, in Australia, I think uh, the books by Len Bedell mm. um, on those roads that he built out in the western deserts which I'm going out to again in a couple of weeks time. And been out there taking people around. I mean, those books just bring that sort of stuff to life. And it was a different time back then, of course. And uh, Aboriginal people now have ownership over much of that land, nearly all of it. In fact. Um, but still the tracks are there and the history is there and all that sort of stuff. So that was a uh, really good, really good books. And then, look, I read an awful lot. Of, I read a lot of uh, Australian history and, and I come to America, American history, uh, Kit Carson. And yeah, all that sort sure. Of stuff. Fascinating. I, yeah, we, we grew up with that in Australia as, you know, as young kids, cowboys in Indians and things like that. But, uh, yeah, Lewis and Clark, we sure. really enjoy the Lewis and Clark stories and that prompts us to travel in America. And uh, yeah, it's a similar thing as in Australia, Burke and Wills. And see, going back to my great, great grandfather, he went with Sturt in you know, the 1844, Amazing. 1845 expedition to Central Australia. So I sort of relate to that. And my grandfather, he rode Pony Express on the Central Australian Railway Telegraph Line before the ends were connected. So yeah, I've got a bit of history going back into that. Yeah. Sort of provides me with the impetus to go and see that travel in those footsteps I guess so I like I like following in the footsteps of explorers it's this tangible sense of history and you would know too from going to the Canning Stock you can touch history on you them, can you know. those wells and everything yeah. else is fascinating sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah absolutely incredible yeah. truly beautiful yeah. and then one of the other things that we like to ask if you were to sit down to have lunch with someone that was getting ready to, to go off and go into the world like you and Viv have and go across yep. Russia or, or the or to go up Africa or whatever what would be uh, the top piece
pieces of advice you would give them? What would be the things that you would want to make sure that they understood? Well, I think I think one of the things, and I'm sure you would have seen the same too, is you don't have to get carried away with the equipment. Mm. You know, just, just step back a bit. People say, oh, what vehicle should I have? And I say, well, what vehicle you got? Yeah. And I'll go a Jeep, Land Rover or something. Why not? Just jump in that and go. I remember we met two young couple in Argentina, a little Toyota Corolla, mm-hmm. roof rack on top, loaded to the gunnel, <laughs> and they were setting off for Alaska. 20-year-old vehicle. If it broke down, it didn't really matter. Right. They couldn't bear it. And I think, I think you've got to have that love of that. And it's not money or that. It's motivation yeah. to get you started, get you out there. And then I say to people, don't keep saying, I'm going to do that one day. Yeah. Set a date. If, you got, if it's a weekend trip, set, set it for two weeks' time or three weeks' time. If it's a month-long trip, set it for six months. Mm-hmm. If it's a trip around the world, go, I'm going to I'm going to shill on the 15th of June, 2023, yeah. and then work towards that. Get the cat sorted out, get the garden <laughs> sorted out, whatever it takes. Sure. You know? But don't keep saying, I'm going to do that one because you won't do it. Set a date. Yeah, it's amazing how we'll continue to give up on our dreams yeah. to satisfy whatever is interesting today, maybe on social media or whatever. Yeah. Which if we if, if you think about the amount of time people spend on, let's call it Facebook, yeah. if you could get back all of that time, <laughs> you would have you'd have the vehicle built, yeah. you have your route planned. Yeah. You've probably made some more money yeah. because you've had more time at work. Sure. Uh, and next thing you know, you're off to go actually see the world instead yeah. of seeing other people do it. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah, that's um, yeah, get out there and do it. Pick up a map and then, and I mean Facebook and all that sort of stuff is great for keeping in touch with people. Don't get too carried away with it. I mean, I'd hate to be starting off as a prospective journalist or call myself just a writer. And um, today, yeah. with the forces of you've got to have a multimedia presence and on Twitter and Facebook, sure. and Instagram and all that sort of stuff. And, and I, we, we, we've got, you know, we do a bit on Facebook and we do a bit on Instagram. But to, to make a living out of it. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tall order, isn't it? Yeah, I've heard lots of people out there trying it. Yeah. And a, a lot sell their soul to lowest bidder. Yeah, they do. To get a set of tires. Or <laughs> just whatever. just buy the tires, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ron, thank you so much Great. for being here in Prescott, for taking some time out of your busy schedule. Uh, thanks to your wife Viv as well for allowing this to all happen, yeah. and for putting up with you going around the world. <laughs> and she, I got a nod from her just now, a big <laughs> nod. You've inspired generations, and uh, you should be very proud of the things that you guys have done, the quality of work that you've done. We're so grateful that your content has been in Overland Journal and on Expedition Portal, and we've been able to share that with our audience as well. How do people find out more about you and Viv and what you're doing? How do they, yeah, how do well, they find you in, yeah, in the well, social our, world? Our, our major website is guidebooks, guidebooks.com.au, okay. AU okay. for Australia. And then we have um, dirtroaddiaries.com.au. And then there's Facebook and uh, Ron Moon. And then there's uh, Remote Australia, Ron, Ron and Viv Moon's Remote Australia Facebook page. Okay. And that's really Australian stuff. Okay. And um, so they- How yeah. about on Instagram? How do they find you on Instagram? I don't even know my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like Ron when I grow up. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, can't remember. That's uh, okay. But um, they could probably search yeah, Ron Moon on there. It's on yeah. there. I mean, if you if you search Ron and Viv Moon Australia, you'll quite find a few it. hits and stuff okay, like that. That's great. And, uh, like I said, going back conversation. Yeah, I like motivating people to go out and have a luxury. And yeah. there's no better way of doing that on a motorbike or all drive, mm. going out and camping, inflatable under a tree kayak, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, for sure, best way of seeing. No, and you've done that. You've motivated so many people to see Australia and to see the world, Ron. So thank you so much for spending the time with me today. We're grateful to have you on the podcast and I look forward to hearing uh, what you're up to next. In fact, that is a question. Where are you guys going next? We're back to Australia uh, next Monday. I'll be heading out in the desert country, uh, running a trip for my son across some of the bomb roads of the uh, Len Bedell built and uh, coast to coast, we call it. We go from the Southern coast to the Northwest coast of Australia. And uh, that's three weeks of remote country. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. About, um, 800, 900 miles between Aboriginal communities. Sure. Uh, you know what it's like. Fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah, that'll be the first trip. I'll come back. We will, uh, we will be spending some time with the parents while I'm out and then we'll uh, head bush and go up to northwestern New South Wales. It's had a lot of rain through there. Ten-year drought's broken. Wow. All the lakes are full. Birds have moved in. Fantastic. Um, it should be fantastic. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we're... Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, well, Ron, thank you so much again for being on the podcast. Yep. Well, thanks we, for having us. You bet. And we thank you all for listening and we'll talk to you next time.